is with great pleasure that I introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Giannis Miolas. Dr. Miolas is president and director of the Museum of Science in Boston, and he came to the museum from Tufts University, where he was dean of the School of Engineering. He's spearheaded by Dr. Miolas. Massachusetts was the first state in the nation to develop a K-12 technology engineering curriculum framework and associated assessments. His dream is to make everyone scientifically and technically literate. As one of the world's largest science centers and Boston's most attended cultural institution, the Museum of Science is ideally positioned to lead the nation in this effort. In 2004, Giannis helped establish the museum's National Center for Technology Literacy to enhance knowledge of engineering and technology for people of all ages and inspire the next generation of engineers and scientists. Dr. Miolas earned his bachelor's and doctoral degrees in mechanical engineering and a master's in economics at Tufts, and later received a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has published over 100 research papers and holds two patents. N named in 2006 by President George, Bush, George W. Bush to the National Museum and Library Services Board, Dr. Miolas has served on the NASA Advisory Council from 2007 to 2009 and on the Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick's Commonwealth Readiness Project Leadership Council, now serving on, the Governor, on Governor Patrick's Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Advisory Council, Giannis is a member of the Board of Trustees of Wellesley College and Tufts University. Please join, join me in welcoming Dr. Giannis Mialis. What a beautiful day and what a great day to start a new journey. And what a wonderful day to share with people that care so much for you, your parents, grandparents, siblings, relatives, teachers, and friends. And I truly feel honored that I, a stranger in the mix, was asked to play a small role in sending you off on your new journey. Now, don't let my Boston accent fool you. <laughs> I actually came from, uh, from Greece uh, as a college freshman uh, to study engineering, as you heard, from Tufts. And I have been graduated a number of times, and I have sat in seats similar to yours a number of times. And commencement speeches are all about inspiring and giving advice. And well, since all of you are now officially engineers, my advice will be from an engineer to engineer. And elements from my advice have been researched, designed, prototyped, tested, redesigned, reprototyped, retested, and now are ready to be presented. <laughs> they all come from my own life experiences, both professional and personal. And I will try to be, in an engineering way, brief and to the point. Advice number one, find a life passion and stick with it. A passion that will continuously define your goals and fuel you with endless energy. Now, you may be wondering, how on earth do I find a life passion. Now, there are many ways you can find one. And in my case, it literally happened by taking a wrong turn while I was driving from our new house back in 1988 to my new job was at Tufts University. Now, I was driving and took a wrong turn. Instead of taking a left turn, I took a right turn, and I ended up at a dead end, which happened to be the parking lot of the neighborhood middle school. Now, we had no children then, um, I had no intention on being involved in K-12 education. I was a new professor at Tufts. I was doing research. We're doing some cool stuff with materials. But I got stuck in the parking lot. And while I was trying to find my way around, I thought, well, we do this cool stuff in my lab, these cool materials that magnets can float up in the air, these superconducting materials. Maybe the kids at the school may be interested in seeing what we do. So I got out of the car. And I met with the principal. The principal introduced me to the eighth grade science teacher who invited me to come and make a presentation the following uh, week to the eighth grade class. So I worked all the week with my students in preparing uh, a presentation with a lots of hands-on activities so the kids would understand the physics behind the materials that we develop. So here I am giving my talk to the eighth graders. And right in front of me was a little blonde girl with frizzy hair, and she was so absorbed to everything I was saying, and she was keeping notes. So at the end of my talk, which I had thought it went pretty well, I thought the kids enjoyed it, I noticed that the teacher, the science teacher, uh, had gathered three boys, and these three boys were introduced to me as his science boys before my talk. So he was bringing the three science boys toward me. The little girl, 
the little girl, blonde girl that was sitting in front of me gets up, sees them coming toward me, cuts right in front of them, and asks me, Dr. Miaoulis, could you help me with my science fair project? Now, I had not signed up to help anybody with a science fair project. I was there to give a talk and be out of there. But I wanted to be polite, so I started talking with her. And as I was talking with her, the teacher pulls me aside and whispers into my ear, don't waste your time with her. She's a mediocre student. She probably become nothing in science. Why don't you work with my science boys? That moment is a responsible moment for me being here today speaking uh, to you. So, as you can imagine, I didn't just pick up and left. I, I started working with the school. Uh, we started revising the lab experiences. We started getting grants, grants from the PTA, the Parent Teacher Association, then grants from the state, then federal grants, then big foundation grants. And, uh, and then I started pulling some of my colleagues from Tufts in helping with the school. Then they got engaged with their school. And at some point, when I became dean of the School of Engineering, science outreach in school was one of the big things Taft was doing. And in the mid-90s, while we're doing all that, we realized that we have it all wrong. Now, think back what you learned in science in school. It's all about the natural world, okay? You learn about rocks and bugs and dinosaurs, uh, a water cycle, a, a, a human body, physics principles, chemistry principles, all about the natural world, which is essential, but you learn almost nothing about the human-made world. Now take a look in the room around you and take away everything that's human-made. What would not be here? There would be no graduation hats, there would be no chairs, there would be no floors, there would be no building, there would be no clothes, and a good bunch of us wouldn't be around because without pharmaceuticals that are human-made, life expectancy is about 27. But this 98% of our world is not part of the curriculum. So we changed when we realized that the whole strategy, and instead of focusing on science, we started focusing on introducing technology, the human-made world, and engineering in schools. Because remember, you spend, when you're in, in middle school, you spend one month learning how a volcano works, and you spend no time learning how a car works. How many times are you gonna find yourself in a volcano compared to a car? 